Okay, let's try this again. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, there we go. So we're off to a good start. So I'm just curious, how many of you had any involvement in deciding what the topic I was doing is? Oh good, so they picked this for you. Yay, I love it. Um, it's, brace yourself, this is a very mature topic. It is very appropriate to young people in the truth, so it's, I would have protested otherwise. But it's a very mature topic, meaning we're going to talk about some things that are very difficult in the world right now. Uh, looking at the letters of Timothy, he's not pulling any punches as he's trying to teach a young man how to establish ecclesias and keep them growing and, and thriving. So I'll start by saying thank you for inviting me, although it sounds like one of you did, so whatever. Um, Timothy is one of the characters in the New Testament we actually know a little more about than many because he has a relationship with Paul. And so relationships are so important, I thought I'd start by just kind of getting a lay of the land. How many of you are baptized? So a few. How many of you are thinking about it? A few more. How many of you are here against your will but committed to endure the week? Okay, well that's good. So there's a lot of room in between those things, so very good. No one's run out yet. So the, the first class, we're really going to try to introduce who Timothy and Paul are and look at the beginning of the first letter and try to get an idea of some of the concepts that Paul is going to be disseminating on Timothy. Um, it helps to get an idea of who they were and what made their relationship work in the beginning. Uh, what do you know about Paul? This is the group participation part, in case you were wondering. The name of the Yep. Name used to be Saul, which is actually a very important. What does Saul mean, by the way, Jim? You know what Paul means? Good. Well, we'll go back to that. Anyway. Yeah, it's been a lot of time in prison. Yeah. School was a Pharisee under Gamaliel. Yeah, absolutely. He was raised to be a Pharisee, and who converted Paul? Jesus, so he had a pretty good connection there, didn't he? So he's raised to be a Pharisee. He's been named after the mighty first king of Israel, who was head and shoulders among the rest, as he hid in the, as, as the nice King James word, the stuff. He hid amongst the stuff uh, when he was about to be made king. So here you've got, you, you're a, a nice Jewish family, and you've got your little boy, and you name him the first king of Israel, a big guy. And then you raise him at the feet of a, Prominent Pharisee, you, you're setting him up for success, aren't you? Are you not? Well, and then he's blinded on the road on the way to Damascus, and they change his name to Little Guy. Literally, that's what Paul means, is little. So you've gone from big, mighty, to he's little, just a little guy. So as we look at this, he's named after the first king of Israel, and he was he was intended by his parents to be something that God did not intend him to be, and so. Good for us, Paul was given an opportunity to take the zeal he had for doing God's work and learn how to do it right. Because no one could, anyone here ever killed someone else because they thought it was the right thing to do for God? Yeah. Okay, good, because I was going to excuse myself if I wanted to raise your hand. Yeah, I'm busy, I gotta go. Sorry. Um, the, the bottom line is he did that though. I mean, he stood at Stephen's feet. I mean, he stood at, uh, when Stephen was stoned, he was holding the coats. Why do you hold the coats for the guys throwing the rocks? Yeah, you don't want to get bloody, so you, maybe that's part of it. Anybody ever try to throw a baseball with a trench coat on? No? Can you imagine to be a little more restrictive? So if I let you take your coat off, you can throw it harder. Hey, that's a nice guy, isn't it? Hey, you know, let me hold your coat so you can throw it a little harder at this guy. And we're going to see Stephen play a very prominent role at the end of the second letter. So Stephen's name is going to come up again. Um, Paul wrote half of the New Testament, and I will argue more than half, um, because I believe he wrote the letter to the Hebrews, although we can't prove that. The other 13, we can. So without the writing of Paul, the New Testament is half the size. Now, I grant you God would have found someone else to do it. It's not like if Paul didn't, God would have said, oh, well, we're not going to write that book. But God was... Uh, God did hand pick Paul to do that work. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 tells us he knows his end is near. So when we look at the first letter, we're looking at him talking to a young Timothy. And we look at the second letter, we're looking at him talking from the perspective of a guy who knows he's about to die. And he's giving to his son in the faith 
some last minute tips on how to stay strong because he knows he's not going to be there any longer to help guide and coach people like Timothy and Titus. And if you ever have read Timothy and Titus together, you'll find it's almost the same material because he's writing to his sons in the faith and they're both doing the same thing, establishing and, and helping build the ecclesias throughout Asia Minor. Uh, anybody know how old Paul was when he died? 62, which is what I look like, but actually older than me. Uh, he, you know, who killed him? Stretching or hand raising? Stretching, okay. Nero. Nero was a pretty fascinating guy, but not if you were a Christian. He was beheaded by Nero in AD 68. So in AD 60, 70, you guys have heard about that a lot, right? Where Jerusalem basically falls into the hands of the Gentiles, and it never is recovered until 1948, and not fully until 1967. So there's a, a big gap. Uh, it starts in AD 70. So Nero beheads Paul in AD 68, telling us that the last letter of Timothy is right at the end of his life. So we see the inspired leader giving advice right before AD 70, and Jesus himself styles AD 70 as a type of his return. So therefore, when we see in the second letter, we get to see Paul preparing his, his uh, grown down children in the faith for what's about to happen, the return of Jesus. That makes it very important to us because it makes it highly relevant. So what do we know about Timothy? We've already mentioned he's considered a son of the truth, so that, that's come up a, a couple times. Uh, the first time, uh, the first letter was written to Timothy while he was in Ephesus, so we'll see a lot about Timothy hanging out in Ephesus. Key theme in the first letter, uh, prepare. The first letter has a, a strong theme of get ready. Get ready because the work you're about to do is difficult. Uh, doctrine matters. You're going to find the word doctrine over and over throughout both letters, but primarily the first letter. I think it's in just about every chapter. Uh, and both of them tie to the second letter, uh, but with greater urgency. Less detail, so there's less information, but more urgency in the matter. Uh, Timothy was a trusted disciple that Paul trusted Timothy to be him in his absence. So he, he, he by extension, then allows the work of Paul to be more effective because we're all more effective when other people are doing work with us than we are uh, by ourselves. One is too small a number to accomplish anything great. So if you want to do anything big in life, you've got to be able to work with other people or you'll be limited by yourself. Second, uh, the second uh, letter we already said, and I've got a nice spelling error, which is nice. Good thing I can see it now when it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, but the one thing you'll find is there, there are seven things Jesus says from the tree as he's crucified. And they're all documented for us. They're all short. Do you know why the things Jesus said while he's crucified are short? Yeah, you can't breathe. So when you're crucified, you actually do not die of blood loss. You die of suffocation. Which is why they broke the feet, the legs of the thieves on the cross. Because picture this. So whether he was crucified like this or like this, you can debate that. And I'm not going to because it doesn't matter. They both do the same thing. But if I am trying to get air in my lungs, so take, put your arms out, take a deep breath. So you just notice your chest rise. If you've ever been in chorus, you've had to do this for that purpose. Well, now... You're sitting and you're comfortable, so it's easy for you to do that. But over time, how hard do you think it would be to hold your arms up like that? If I said, just hold them up that way for the rest of the class, and you don't hate my guts and I have no class tomorrow. So I'm not going to do that. But the point is, it gets harder the more time it takes. Having their feet able to use for pressure means they don't have to lift themselves up to breathe with their arms only. They can use their feet as well. Well, if I break your legs, you can't do that anymore. And now you're hanging all of your weight on your arms and if you can't lift your chest you can't open your lungs and if you can't open your lungs you suffocate so when jesus says seven things they're all short because these are dying words he is suffocating and he gives little glimpses as to what he's thinking one of the things he says is actually a direct quote of stephen who was paraphrasing jesus so the, the thing we're going to find at the end of paul's second letter is that Jesus and Paul were on his mind throughout his entire ministry. 
So we're going to see this role. We're going to play Timothy. We're going to look at Paul as telling us how to work well in the last days in the Ecclesia, how we can work together to be strong, strong in doctrine, strong in preparation, and strong as a group so that we can listen to our mentor and serve, serve as God's family. So let's begin. So we're, we're not going to do a reading of the beginning of this class, so we're going to go verse by verse through the book. So 1 Timothy 1, verse 1, we have Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So he calls himself an apostle here. He does that in a number of letters. It's interesting to see how Paul addresses himself when he starts his letter. Uh, he, he calls himself an apostle for the Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians. Uh, when he addresses himself to Philippians and to Titus, he calls himself a servant. Uh, to Thessalonians, he refers to himself as a brother. Uh, he even calls himself a prisoner in Philemon, which makes sense given the context. Because he is speaking to Timothy now from a position of authority. He is an apostle. He's a teacher. He's a leader. And he wants his authority to be based on God. The commandments of God. And the work of the hope Jesus Christ has given us. So he's not giving his pedigree. There's places he does that where he talks about being raised in the feet of Gamaliel and you know, Pharisee of a Pharisee and the stripes I took and the shipwreck I had. He's not doing that here. Right here he's, just, he's building on authority of the relationship he and Timothy have. Now he's building on the pedigree that he is following the commandment of God and the hope of Jesus. Now, the word commandment appears in the New Testament seven times. And you're going to find it. Uh, there are some Bible numbers that get me excited. I, I know there are some people that can go like four plus three minus seven. And, and they go nuts. I, I'm not that guy. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just not interesting to me. But number five, six, seven, eight, twelve, forty. Those numbers get my attention. And anything divisible by seven. So if you hear me bring them up, you may not be excited by it. But you'll see it. I can still pretend. So in uh, all of Paul's letters is where that word is used. So it's used seven times, but the only one to use it in the New Testament in the Greek is Paul. Uh, it's also the word translated authority in Titus 2 and 15. So it's a, it's a word that he's going to say to both of his sons in the faith. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Anyone know what Timothy's name means? Somebody said it. I don't know who it was, but they mumbled it and they were right. So whoever mumbled, mumble again. <laughs> oh, come on, I'm embarrassed if I wasn't trying. Honoring God. Whoever said honoring God, you were right. Your, your answer was right, your confidence was weak. Nobody said it, I'm hearing things, this is going to be fun. Well, I'm having a good time in my head, thanks for participating. <laughs> but his name means honoring God. He, he was Paul's companion in Acts, oh, we won't look it up, 16 and 20 if you're keeping score. Uh, he sent him to Ecclesiastes in Corinth, in Philippi, and Thessalonica. So Timothy and Paul having a, a relationship where they work together, this is something that's being built on from the very beginning. Um, he's also credited in the authorized version for delivering Hebrews. In fact, uh, it's noted in chapter 13, verse 23 and 25, further evidence that Paul wrote Hebrews and sent it to Timothy, but I digress. Um, Timothy was sent to a number of ecclesias to help, which we mentioned, and it's an almost identical reading that we see in Titus chapter 1, verse 4. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some of them they teach no other doctrine. So the, the word besought in the RSV says urged. I have urged you to abide still. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about abide later, so I'm going to skip over that for now. But the charge I want to focus on for a minute. This word's used six times in the New Testament. Uh, it's translated command in 1 Timothy 4 and 11. Uh, and in chapter, it's used in uh, chapter 5, verse 7, chapter 6, verse 13, chapter 6, verse 17. It's used a lot in that it's only six times, uh, it, and we see that it's compounded in this first letter. Now, the word some in the RSV and in the Greek, it actually is a certain person. So the English, it sounds kind of generic, but it's not. He's got people in mind when he says some. He's just not calling them out by name yet. They're actually named later in chapter 1, verse 20. So we'll talk more about them. And we'll see what these have done throughout the letter. So he's using both positive and negative examples. He's going to call out some people who have not been examples of what you're supposed to do as you are... Uh, being an active member in Ecclesia. 
And if the word teach, the only other New Testament use of that word is chapter 6, verse 3. So it's, again, yeah, it's a whole exclusive. So he starts this charge with, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. So the, the, the word fables really means myths. In fact, that's what it's translated in the RSV. Uh, used five times in the New Testament. Not surprisingly, most of them are in Titus and Timothy. So uh, don't give heed to the myths that are around you. Genealogy is only other times used as Titus. So I'm setting a stage between the two of them. You probably figure that out by now. Now, the word minister questions, the RSV translate as promote speculations. Think of it that way. Don't give heed to fables that promote speculation. What do you think that means? What's a modern English way of saying don't give heed to myths that promote speculation? How would you say that in English today? Don't listen to lies. Yeah, don't listen to lies and don't try to create controversy. If you're, if, what you're trying to do is promote speculation. You're stirring the pot and you're making inclusion life harder. So let's not do that. Let, let's not try to make it. Does inclusion life get messy from time to time? Yes, it does. I'm sorry if that broke your bubble. That's true. But we don't do it on purpose. And if, if we are promoting speculation, we're creating a problem. And he's telling him, don't get sucked into the lies around you that are promoting speculation and creating division. But I want you to focus, and we're going to see, is focus on godly edifying, which we'll start defining here in a couple of verses, as doctrine. Um, the word edifying is the only time that word's used in the New Testament, and it means build. So I want you to do the building for God, which is in faith. So it's not one or the other, but more than we need to avoid nonsense that can distract from the meeting. But the true purpose has to be to build on God's behalf. So it's not one of these. It's not just avoid the nonsense. It's not just build. It's got to be both. Avoid the nonsense and build. And that's important for us because our natural inclination is to do one or the other. But we're exhorted to do both. To be careful not to get sucked into the nonsense. But then to not just avoid. Because you're not going to avoid your way to the kingdom of God. Hey, I never sinned. I'm in. Sorry, you're already out then. So am I. We all sin and fall short. So we're not going to avoid our way to the kingdom. But we do have to avoid certain things and replace it with positive things. And that's actually a life example we're going to see a number of times in this first letter. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Now, anyone know what the word charity is? King James almost always translates this word, charity. Every, almost others translate, translate yeah, this word love. You know what, it, what the word is in Greek? It is agape. It's agape. What, what's agape mean? It, it is, it's an active word. It really is a love of self-sacrifice. So you'll find there's different words for love in the Greek. There's three, actually. Did we know what the three primary words for love are in the Greek? So you got agape, so there's one. And that one, by the way, is only used in the Bible or in books written about the Bible. It's not used in Greek literature. How about philia? You ever heard of this place called Philadelphia? What is it called? The city of brotherly love, because the word in Greek is Delphi or Delphos, which is brethren, and Philio, which is love. So, Philio is not a second rate love, it's just a different kind of love. It's, uh, Philio uh, is more of an affection, it's a family love. Uh, so, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just a different type of love. And the other word is Eros, which is actually not used in the Bible at all, it's in Greek literature. Um, and, and that's a sexual love. So those are the three primary loves used uh, in Greek literature. In the Bible, we only focus on two. The love of the family and a love of self-sacrifice. So anytime you see the word charity in the King James, it's likely the word agape or agapeo, which is the verb form of the noun agape. So uh, in any case, so now he's telling them out of a self-sacrificing love, with a pure heart and a good conscience. Faith unfeigned. Unfeigned is sincere in the RSV. It's translated without hypocrisy in James 3 and 17, if you're looking for another way of saying that same word. So have this self-sacrificing love with a pure heart, a good conscience, and faith that is sincere. It gives us the right motive to serve the body. So far, so good. Have I lost anybody yet? 
All right. Verse 6, some having swerved have turned aside into vain jangling. So the some, probably those mentioned in verse 3. Now the word serve, there's only two other times this word is used, and we translated have erred. So they have erred uh, and turned aside. And actually they're both in Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 and 18 and 1 Timothy 6 and 21. So the image in English is of missing an object, which uh, the Greek is more direct as an error, using a Hebrew phrase. Uh, do you know what the word for sin means in Hebrew? I'm going to give you a hint. My pictures that probably don't make sense are usually tied to what I'm saying, not what's on the screen if you're trying to figure it out. What does it look like that archer has done? Yeah, they've missed the mark a lot. They're not very good. Well, that's so what... What the word sin in Hebrew literally means to miss the mark. If I'm aiming for the bullseye and I hit the, the ground underneath it, I have sinned. I have missed the mark. Well, what this is, the Greek picking up on a Hebrew concept to miss the mark. Uh, and that's why it says they have swerved in the English world or have erred. They have turned aside. They have deviated. They have missed the mark of what? What was that verse we just looked at? Of self-sacrificing love with a pure heart and the right motive. That's the part they missed because they've gone, in this case, to vain jangling, which means an empty talk. It's vain or empty talk. That's the only time that word appears in the New Testament. So they've gone from the commandments of God with love and a pure motive, and they have now gone to self-serving self -serving talk that promotes themselves. You can see the problem here. Is it, that would be a problem in Ecclesia, wouldn't it? Especially if it's amongst prominent brethren, which we'll see by name in a minute. Now, verse 7 these brethren wanted to be teachers of the law. And we've already got a problem now. Their desire is they wanted to be a teacher. But understanding neither what they say nor, uh, nor whereof they affirm. So I want to be, I want to be a doctor. Yeah, okay, great. You're awesome. Well, why do you want to be a doctor? Because I want to put doctor in front of my name. Okay, you're not going to be a good doctor. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, I want to be a doctor because I want to help people. I want to save people. Okay, you've got a chance. Your motive is good. But if you just want to be a doctor or a teacher, so people will call you doctor, hey, Dr. Dennis, hey, come on, man, you're, you're never going to be any good at that because it's for you, it's not for others. And that same rule applies in the Ecclesia. If we want to be a teacher, but we're building on an empty philosophy and, and fleshly thinking, instead of scripture out of a pure heart and a, a pure motive, well, <coughs> we're going to be building for ourselves and not for our God. It's an easy thing to do. It's a very easy thing to do. And we have to make sure we're going God's way because we are all naturally inclined to go the way of ourselves. You ever heard the phrase, uh, that there's no rest for the wicked? Any of you ever complained you were tired? Maybe even this morning? You ever went away, I must be wicked? No, you, it's funny how you do that, right? Like, oh, there's no rest for the wicked. Wait a minute, those two together don't make me sound very good right now. The key is to make sure we look at scripture and find how does it impact me, not how it impacts everybody else. As long as I'm going, boy, I wish so-and-so was here to say that, I've missed the point. The message is there for me. And if I can learn it and live it, I can teach it to other people because people will learn by who I am, not really by what I say. If all I am is what I say, you'll see me as a phony in time. Right? You guys pretty much feel it, figure you can pick out the phony, the guy who... You, you know I've ever heard of a humming gear before? All right, close your eyes. I'm going to paint a picture in your head. I'm not going to go on the wall. Close your eyes. I want you to picture an alligator mouth on a hummingbird body. Okay, you can open your eyes now. That is a hummingator. They talk a big game, but they can't back up. If you are the person that is talking to somebody who's got, a, they can talk a big game, but they don't back it up with who they are, do you figure you're, you can smell, smell that, you can sense that, but like, yeah, this guy's not really what I think they, he or she is? you feel like you've got a good gauge for that? Do you realize everybody in the room is either nodding or looking at me with a glazed doll stare of a dairy cow right now? So you all think you're good at that, which means people catch you when you do it. Knowing that puts the pressure on you and I to actually be the people we pretend to be with our words. And then we're not coming here. By the way, the word humming gator is not in the Greek or the Hebrew or the teaching score. Uh, we have to focus on getting God's way and not getting our way. Because if I'm focused on getting what I want, it's not about God, it's about me. 
And now I am in that vain, jangling, useless talk category that Timothy is being counseled to avoid. Now the word teachers, the only other two are translated doctors of the law. And that's in Luke 5 and 17 and Acts 5 and 34. They're both referring to the Pharisees. And uh, in the Acts version, he is referring to his personal teacher, Gamaliel, uh, who in the meeting wants to be called a Pharisee. Anyone here going, boy, I hope Jesus, when he sees me, he says, man, you are a Pharisee. Where do you go? None of us is hoping for that. Did you receive the Acts reference? Yeah, it was Acts 5 and 34. And that one's specific to Gamaliel, but in Luke 5 and 17 is, is generic to Pharisees. Now, the, the word affirm at the end, the RSV translates it, make assertions. So they understand not what they say, nor what assertions they're making. Uh, similar context to in, in uh, Titus chapter 3 and 8, if you want to connect the dots later. So now we're going to get colorful. Now, verse 8. Know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinner, for unholy and profane, murderers of fathers, and murderers of mothers, and manslayers. So that doesn't sound like a list of people this is good for, does it? Now the word know in the Greek, this is the see and perceive word, and we're going to call out a couple different words for know. This one is to see and perceive, so we perceive that the law is good. Good, beautiful, it's used 17 times in the book, it's a popular word in the first chapter, in the first letter. Now, uh, the word use in the Greek, the purple word over, over my shoulder, is to borrow in the Greek. So, the law is good if a man borrows it lawfully or properly, as the Greek suggests. Now, the law is not made for a righteous man. And the word made in the Greek is to lie down like an infant or, or a person who's buried. So, it's not something to be laid down for a righteous or the unruly, as the word disobedient means, or the unholy, or the profane. We'll see that theme in both letters. Um, so maybe we'll look that up. The, the only time the word profane is used outside of First and Second Timothy is Hebrews 12, verse 16. Uh, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So you guys know the story of Jacob and Esau, right? By the way, if you're going to figure this out really quick. I love the brick Bible. It cracks me up. So you'll see a lot of Legos over my shoulder. And just, if you've not read it, you should have read it. In any case, uh, Jacob and Esau. Esau's referred to as a, a profane person. I love Esau as an example, especially to young people. And here's why. Esau, if you had a choice between hanging out with Esau and Jacob, odds are you would pick Esau. Let's talk about what we know about him. Esau is generous. He's forgiving. Uh, he's a, a man's man. He's a hunter. He's the athlete of today. Uh, he's daddy's best guy. Uh, he is, seems to be pretty decent with the ladies. Esau forgives Jacob. Well, he gets mad, so he had short fuse, but then he forgives him and generously welcomes him to his household and says, keep your stuff. I've got plenty. Well, what do we know about Jacob? Well, stole from his brother, deceived his father. I mean, you ever thought about he used goat's skin on his arm? And just, so, okay, we go, that's kind of weird. You know what's really weird? It worked. That's how hairy he, Esau was. Can you imagine petting a goat and thinking, that's my brother? I mean, okay, maybe you can. Can you imagine petting a goat and thinking, boy, that feels just like my son? That's, the fact that it worked is astounding. Esau was obviously not just a little hairy guy. He's a very hairy guy. So here's the point. Jacob is shown as a swindler. Esau is shown as a pretty good guy who was duped. But why is he referred to as profane? There was one big difference between Jacob and Esau, and it changed everything. Esau could care less about the things of God. He was a good human being. We would you know, good Christian God. He didn't really care about the things of God. He's just a good guy. That's why he gave away his birthright and the hope of the promises for a pot of soup. Now look, the fact that he thought he was going to die, oh, he thought he was near death. How many people, after one bowl of soup, have survived starvation? Okay, he was hungry. He wasn't near death. It was a cheap sale because he didn't value the promise. There we have Jacob, who was willing to do anything to inherit the promises, even things he shouldn't do, like, you know, lie to his dad and see his father and steal from his brother. Those were all the wrong thing, but for the right reason. 
Jacob paid prices for that, and Jacob changed. Jacob grew from a weasel to the prince of God. Esau didn't change. He was just a good guy from beginning to end, had no interest in the things of God, so he's referred to as profane. So that's why when we see Esau, we see him in the Genesis record, and he's not really a bad guy, but he's got a huge missing ingredient and cares nothing for the things of the Father. What a dangerous thing that is in an ecclesial family, is it not? To be a good person and not care about God's way? That's the danger of Esau. That's why he's used in this setting. In fact, watch how the list builds in Timothy from here. So, picking up at verse 9 ish, we have profane murderers of fathers. How do you like that? Murderers of mothers. Man, so this is not a list of things you want in your ecclesia. Uh, keep reading, verse 10. Whoremongers. What's that? I don't even know what that word means. I know that's probably not a word you use often. I hope. No idea? It's a male prostitute. That's what that word means. How about them that defile themselves for mankind? Actually, it's better rendered with mankind. Um, no other way to say this in the Greek, that word is sodomite. Modern language homosexual. So when we look at this word, this is, this is the list we're putting the good guy Esau in with. Uh, men stealers, or kidnappers, as the RSV says, liars, so we know what that is. Yeah. Perjured persons, which is a false swearer. And if there be any other thing contrary to sound doctrine, that's kind of interesting. So we've got this list of nasty things. And by the way, if there's anything else that I forgot to say, it's against doctrine, it's on this list. That's kind of the catch-all. What the world considers acceptable, we cannot. Because what I just read would probably get you in trouble if you said that at school. But that's what God says. And that's what Paul is exhorting Timothy as he's building an ecclesia. So we have to be careful because we live in a world that desensitizes us to everything. And that's their job. Because as long as everything is okay, I'm okay. And if I can make everybody think everything is okay, then what I do doesn't matter, I'm okay. It's really more about ego than anything else. But it's not God's path that the world is trying to follow. If we're trying to do things God's way, we've got to identify what is right and dedicate our life to trying to do it. We're going to fall short. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to miss the mark. But if we're not even aiming for the mark, we're in deep trouble because we're going to follow a path that leads to destruction. That's what the world is setting us up for. This world we live in today, perhaps th this might be the most important verse if you only remember one thing this morning. This is what I'm hoping it is. Look at the time, so I don't get kicked out. Okay. Um, Isaiah 5, verses 20 through 21. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. We'll add more to this concept later, but that is the world around us. It's trying to determine what's right and what's wrong. They're not interested in the things of God. They're interested in pleasing self. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. We all have it, and if you're not finding it, you're losing it. Because we all are drawn to serve ourselves. Hey, what does a baby do when it cries? I, I, I answer my own question, sorry. No wonder you all look at me like, what are you talking about? What? Okay, I ruined my story, but I'm going to say it anyways. What does a baby do when it's hungry? It cries. cries. When it's tired? Cries when it's dirty. Now, most people grow out of that. Some don't. But why does the baby cry whenever it wants something? Because it's the only way it Yeah, it has no it's master language. Could you imagine the three day old going, hey, mom, you know, actually, I'm hungry. Can I have a snack? That'd be a little creepy. But the baby cries because we are designed self centered. What would happen if the baby didn't cry and it was really hungry? It would probably die. Yeah, because it, it's, it, it can't feed itself. It's not like, oh, I know I'm only three days old, but I'm going to go out and harvest some grain and make some bread. It, it can't do that. They're totally dependent on someone else, which means we are all designed selfish. We are born crying when we need help. Now, hopefully we refine our language enough that it doesn't like, eh, but that some, I know for some people it does sound like Well, we we're designed selfish as a survival skill, but our God asks, asks us, asks us, to deny self and follow his way, he's actually asking us to deny the nature he's given us. Have you ever thought about that? We're asked by our God to deny the nature he's given us. Why? 
Because he wants us to be part of his family. He wants us to be part of his glory. And he has given us a roadmap to do so. But to be part of that family, we have to recognize the challenge of the world around us, starting with us. For me to condemn the world for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, well, look, I got it too. What entices me might be different than what entices you, but we all have that natural draw to things we know we shouldn't have. Recognizing it and going, time out, I've got to get this back on God's path. Once we figure out how to do that in our life, can we not help other people do it too? So you've got to start with you. Ecclesial service starts with getting yourself right with God. Let's keep going. Verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust, the literal Greek of what's in yellow is I was persuaded by, or I believed. The glorious gospel that I Believed. He's referencing to the sound doctrine of verse 10, recalling his conversion, which we already mentioned on the road to Damascus. We'll look at it again in a couple verses. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, or the little Greek is I hold grace that Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, hath counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. The word enabled in the RSV is translated to give me strength. So he's thankful that Jesus gave him the strength to essentially be told everything you think you know about God is wrong, I want you to change all of that and go this direction. Do you recognize that's the same chance Esau had? Esau could have chosen another path, but instead chose a path that was profane. You heard of this, these brothers called Cain and Abel? The conversion of Paul and the story of Cain and Abel is actually the same until you get to the fork of the road. Doing it wrong, thinking it's right, and then you come to the conclusion that God tells you you're wrong. Cain refused to change. Paul changed everything. At the fork in the road, it's the same story. Before, he sees himself as a blasphemer, as a persecutor, an injurious, or the RSV, he was an insulter. He's referring specifically to Stephen. And we'll come back to him toward the end of our classes. Uh, he did it ignor ignorantly. He didn't know. He thought he was doing good for God, but he was wrong. And so Jesus on the road to Damascus made it clear, this is not what I want from you. And Paul had to change literally everything in his life and then go back to the people he'd been persecuting and see if they'd accept him as their brother. How's that feel? The person that has treated you the worst in your life, and I don't even know who they are, but there's somebody in this planet that you go, man, that's the person I want to spend the least amount of time with in my life. Imagine that person then coming to you saying, I love you, I'm your brother. How can I help? Can you help me? Part of you would go, like, is this a joke? And did not the first century go, I think he should try to deceive us? Yes, they did. Paul had to endure his own insults back to become a faithful Christian in the service to, to Jesus. It's a direct contrast to those in verse 3 that had the truth and squandered it into fables. Here was a person who once believed a lie, but now he saw the light literally and was changing his life to match the truth. The grace of the Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So this RSV says it overflowed. And that word love is the word agape. So it's the same word. It's a faithful saying, this word logo, so that's the word plan or purpose. A faithful plan and worthy of all uh, acceptation. RSV says full acceptance. Uh, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I am foremost. Jesus came to the world, this word cosmos, the order of things, to save sinners. And here, I'm sinner number one. It starts with me. Isn't that a different perspective? If, if there's a problem in the, in the ecclesia, let's say you are a problem in the ecclesia, and somebody comes to you and says, you're the problem in this ecclesia. How do you go, Thank you. I, I love that you had the confidence to say that to me. Thank you for demonstrating your concern. Is that how you think? What do you think? Be honest. What do you think when somebody approaches you like that? I know it's never happened in your ecclesia. Those who are without sin can throw the first Yeah, it's like, yeah, I, I can see a big log in your face. You want to catch my splinter? Yeah, it, exactly. We naturally get our back up like, who do you think you are? Now, 
Take that same scenario, you really are uh, uh, sinning and you know you're wrong, and somebody cares about you and you know they care about you, and they say, you know I love you, and I want to talk to you about this, and here's why. Here's what, I have this same problem, and here's what a mess it made, and I wish I had figured it out sooner, and somebody had come to me and said, hey Dennis, see this. I love you, and I want to help you see it. Now, do you like that? Not really, because nobody wants to be told, by the way, you're sinning. But do you take it much differently than the person that came to you with a self-righteous attitude, like you're the only sinner in the room? So that's the concept. When Paul acknowledges the sins of others, he starts by saying, I'm chief sinner, here I am, number one. I'm not better than you. I, I might have more experience than you, but I also have more experience on doing it wrong than you. And as long as we demonstrate love as we tell people and show our own humility that we're not coming from a point of I'm, I'm just a little bit better than you. We're coming from a point of I am no better than you. I've made this mistake before you and I want to help you through it. It puts us in a very different place. It also tells us why relationships are so important because if you know I love you and I say something you don't want to hear, you might not like it, but my love for you overrides that. Now, if you don't think I care about you, and the only time you ever hear my voice is when I'm saying something you don't want to hear, I'm ineffective. Even if I'm right, I'm ineffective. There are people on this planet that could call me right now and say, Dennis, you are an idiot. I need you to change your thinking. And I know they love me, and it would get my attention, and I would go, okay, I, they're not saying it just to be mean. They love me, and it would get my attention. Now, it's not everybody, so I'm not recommending you introduce me that way. But there are people just like that for you, that you know they love you, and if they said something you didn't want to hear, coming from them, it would work. Beauty of relationship in the, in the Ecclesia is if we have those relationships before the problems come, those relationships can make those problems something we can overcome together. Because if the only time you hear my voice is when there's a problem and you don't see any love in between problems, even when I'm right, I'm ineffective. That's part of what we're looking at. So he's looking at himself as sinner number one, He's talking to a person who also is a sinner, and you're, you've got an ecclesia full of sinners. By the way, you've heard that this is actually broke up from Be Transformed Volume 1. The, the ecclesia is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. It's not like, ooh, this is where we go when we want to pretend we're perfect. And everybody puts on their best show on Sunday morning. This is how I always am. We all know it's not true. Put on our best face on Sunday. The ecclesia is a place where we have to recognize we're all sinners together. It's not a place just to promote, I'm really sinless Monday through Saturday, I'm proving it on Sunday morning for an hour. Now, I'm a miserable sinner all week, I'm a miserable sinner right now. That's ah, okay, I know you're a miserable sinner too, let's be miserable. Miserable sinners together and try to stop sinning. That's the concept of the life. For this cause I obtained mercy. This is why he received mercy. So he could teach other sinners how to go back to the way and do it God's way. That in me first Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting. So that word first, by the way, is the same word we translated as chief in verse 15. So me, chiefly, Jesus had to work with my sin first. And once he demonstrated his love for me and my sin with patience, it became a pattern or an example I could use to help other people. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. So, the word eternal is the word aeon. The RSV translates this as the King of Ages. So the King of Ages. Immortal seven times in the New Testament. The other six are all translated incorruptible. So we have the King of the Ages. Incorruptible, invisible, wise, be glory forever and ever. Aeon, aeon, to the end of the age. Amen. That's what it's all about. It's about me being refined as a sinner to be part of the glory of God and be part of the family of God for eternity. That's the whole purpose in our walk to the kingdom. This charge I commit to thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which, I, which went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare. So the, the word charge is the word we talked about in verse 5 of command. The Greek for a war is a military expedition. You are in a battle. It's a battle against your own nature, your natural inclination, to trade your thinking for God's thinking, your way for God's way. And the word warfare in the Greek is a campaign. The only other time it's used is 2 Corinthians 1, which this one's worth looking. 
2 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God to the putting down of strongholds. It, it's not about our flesh. We're fighting against the flesh. But we can be strong against the thinking of the flesh if we let God help us with our thinking. Holding faith, the good conscience, some having put it away, concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So the, those that have cast away the concept of a pure conscience and faith have made a shipwreck of their life. Again, the only other time that word is used is in Corinthians. This one, 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul's referring to himself as thrice sh suffering shipwreck. So he's making a very personal connection to experience in his life to the challenge of letting the flesh run the ecclesia. In fact, notice that he lists his perils, the last one, is perils amongst false brethren. You know what that word is in Greek? Pseudo Delphos. So, Philio Delpho, the city of brotherly love, how do you like Pseudo Delphos, the false brethren? We want to be known as Christadelphians, not Pseudo Delphians. We want to be the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ because we are trying to change our life to match His and to the glory of the Father. If we're not, and we're pretending to be so, or pseudo -dopos. As long as we're breathing, we have a chance to change it. But before we can change it, we have to acknowledge it. Now, verse 20, he calls out a few humans, Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may not learn to blaspheme. Uh, so, Hymenius, his name in Greek means belonging to marriage, which is interesting. He's mentioned again in 2 Timothy, so he's a character that played trouble in, in, uh, in the Ecclesias that Timothy was familiar with uh, for a while. Alexander means man defender. And he's possibly the person referenced in 2 Timothy 4 and 14. I think he is, but I can't prove that. I've delivered to the adversary. So these certain persons from earlier in the chapter now are being recorded for evil in God's inspired, inspired word. That's not a place we want to be. We'd rather be on the nice list, the list of the brethren that helped Paul in his journeys. That he's saying hi to this family, and hello to this brother, and hi to this sister. Not, well, that's when I delivered to the adversary because he's a white guy. We have a lot of material in this class, so I thought we would finish this class with the first couple verses of chapter 2. Because chapter 2 and 3 are going to take a little bit more time. How am I on time? You're fine. I'm fine. And everybody's awake. Most people are awake. Yes. In verse 19 of chapter 1, it says, Some have put away the turning paper, have made shepherds. Is that some of the same word as in verse 3? It's the word certain persons from verse 3, yeah. So I think it's the same people. And I think they're just called out by name later. All right, so we'll read the first couple verses as we stop this morning. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, so now he's shifting gears. So he, he's kind of set the stage. I'm a chief sinner. You're a sinner. You guys are trying not old enough to get the Dr. Pepper commercial. You guys know the one that I'm a pepper, you're a pepper, he's a pepper, she's a pepper. Wouldn't you like to be a pepper, too? You get it. <laughs> you have to look that one up on YouTube. That's actually a commercial in the 70s and 80s. It was very popular right before you were conceived. But that's what I think of every time I think about Paul addressing himself as chief sinner, talking to a group of sinners like, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. Yeah. Okay, so now that I've identified myself as the chief sinner and the example of what not to be, and I'm trying to change my life to be the example of what you're supposed to be, now, as an apostle, I'm going to give you an exhortation because I put myself in the proper place to be able to be an effective teacher. So, first of all, supplications, which is normally translated as prayer. It just means needs or asking. So it's, it's a word that's usually translated prayer. And then we have prayer, which is specifically prayer to God. That, that's what it means according to Thayer's and Strong's. Intercessions, the word Greek means an interview, a coming together. The only other time to choose in chapter 4, verse 5, I guess what is translated as prayer. And then we have giving of thanks, which is Eucharista in the Greek, almost always used in the conjunction of prayer. Basically, he said, I want you to pray, and then pray, and then pray, and then pray. Four different words that mean prayer. He's emphasizing you have to live a life of prayer. Put together, we have pray for our needs, pray to God, pray to come together, pray for thanks. Live a life of prayer, because as long as I am appreciating the work of my Father, it allows me to stop focusing on whatever work I might be building for my flesh. Live a life of prayer. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, uh, 17, pray without ceasing. So live a life of prayer is his exhortation. 
For kings, for all that are in authority, we may have uh, that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodliness and honesty. So the authority is the high positions in the RSV. For those that are in high positions, the word lead, the only other word, uh, time this word is used to translate living in Titus 3 and 3, that we are living a quiet and peaceable life. And the only other time that word peaceable used is translating quiet. So again, both words mean tranquility. So I want you to pray, 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 and I want you to live a lot of uh, life that's quiet and quiet. We want to do this in all goodliness, or godliness, sorry, which in the, uh, the Greek is reverence or respect. Live a life that's quiet, respectful, with honesty. The, in, according to Thayer's, this is a characteristic which entitles to reverence and respect. It's only the two times it's used in translating gravity. So, do we live in a place and time where the political environment allows us to live in relative peace and quiet? That's rhetorical. No, we don't. What should we, we do in this time? Praying with emphasis that we can stand apart in a world of darkness in some measure as a light of truth. Not by what we say, but by who we are. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. For who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Now, the, the word sight actually, the, it's only translated before, it's acceptable before God. When God's looking at us, it's an opportunity for us to be seen as acceptable in His eyes, which is truly what we want. Now, the word knowledge, this is a different word than the, the, the perception one we saw earlier. This one is a precise and correct knowledge. It's to know and to know it right. So, for us to be saved, to be seen as good before the Father in our inspection, which we'll talk more about in the next couple of days, we have to have a knowledge correctly of the truth. So our closing verses are actually going to be from John 3. It's a section of scripture everybody knows. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but through the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. That men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's only two verses away from the most popular verse in the Bible. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, for they are wrought in God.